Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 7 and 8. And uh, bear with me as we uh, are going to share maybe a couple of new concepts with you today in our um, application of our text. And we're going to just work on a couple of these verses first and then uh, read the rest of the chapter to you, but then we'll just start working through it. Bear with me because I'm going to share some things with you. But I, it's not going to be like this is the first time you're going to hear it. We're going to continue some things we've already said, and we're going to continue to say some things that we're going to say today for reinforcement and because it, it takes a little while. You need to hear these things over and over and over again so that you, it can become part of your life and, and help you. The title I have today is Steady As She What? Goes. And that's a, that's a nautical uh, slogan uh, can be. Uh, he's going to again give us these nautical words. He's going to speak, in fact, in verse um, 19, the hope we have as an anchor of the soul, of course, is our Lord. And in the catacombs, there are many pictures encrypted on the rock there. And uh, the inscription underneath the pictures of the anchors that they have in the catacombs is spes in Christo, which means hope in Christ. And so they'll, have a, they'll say that and they'll have a picture of an anchor. So, um, so I picked this title today and going with that theme that not only does he have in this chapter, but also in chapter 3. Um, chapter 2 and chapter 3 and uh, chapter 4 as he uses uh, some nautical uh, words. But to, um, to finish this uh, one thought that we've been working on the last uh, few uh, weeks, let, let's look at verse 7 and 8 as he illustrates what he had been trying to tell uh, these Christians at Hebrews. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So we'll just have some thoughts as we stop there before we move on. Remember the goal of the Christian life is to, that he is giving here to these people is to press on to maturity. Uh, as we do that, or in order to do that, we're going to have to have a steady hand at the wheel. And we'll illustrate what that means uh, later on. I'm going to use the New King James today because the NIV has it wrong. The NIV makes one think there are two different plots of land. In the Greek text, there is only one. The New King James, the King James, the New American Standard get it right in their translation. And so there is only one plot of ground that has the same rain, but two different outcomes. Let me read some things to you from Dr. Allen. Uh, and what he has to say uh, about this text. Uh, these people are not apostates. An apostate is a person, again, who held a certain position and later totally refuted it. So in this case, in the terms of Christianity, it would mean one who held the truth that Jesus was the Messiah and that his person and work on the cross is all that one needs to be in a right relationship with God by grace through faith. Later on, this person, even though they held this to be true, later on in their life, they said, no, I don't hold that to be true anymore. That would be the thinking of a, a person that's an apostate. Um, I was visiting with someone and they had told me about their daughter who was raised in church she made a profession of faith at some point in her childhood. 
Then she became an adult, and she married a Jewish man. And in so doing, she converted, she proselyted to Judaism. That would be apostasy. That would be someone who held this truth about Jesus at one point, but when you join ranks in Judaism with the Jews, you refute categorically that Jesus was God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, that He died on the cross to pay for our sins, and He was Yeshua, Messiah. You refute all of that. You say, no, in fact, He was a blasphemer. He deserved to die. And every man that dies on a tree is cursed, so that man couldn't be our Messiah. And so she joined ranks with this group of people. Now, I would say, uh, along with many others, that she didn't lose her salvation. She never had it in the first place. She made a profession of faith intellectually, but she never came to know the Lord. I believe personally, and I think it's all over the map, and once a person becomes a believer, they are secure, eternally secure in Christ Jesus. My author is saying here that this text is not speaking about apostates, but speaking to Christian people. We don't press unbelievers to go on to maturity, but to be converted. And so he is going to illustrate what we've already tried to talk about in the last three Sundays, and we'll try not to regurgitate all of that again through an agricultural illustration lesson of one plot of ground with, with two different outcomes uh, from the same rain. And so the contrast is not between two different groups of people, but rather two possibilities that may affect one group of people. And this is shown in this illustration of two different results, one plot of ground. Two possible outcomes for Christians, those who press on to maturity and those who don't. The word here is used in um, uh, adakimos. Uh, this word is used in English, worthless. And some people get thrown by that word. The, mean, the word literally means not standing the test. It means to be disqualified. It means to be unapproved. Paul himself used this word to describe his own race before God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 27, he said, I buffet my body, I discipline my body, that I might not be adikamos, that I might not be disqualified, that I might not meet the test, that is, his works as a Christian, his faith. He wasn't saying, gee, I hope I don't lose my salvation. He was saying, gee, I hope I don't lose my reward at the judgment seat of Christ. The word cursed here is used, uh, but the text does not say the ground is cursed. That is that plot of ground uh, that received the rain but didn't produce good fruit. It produced thorns and thistles, but is in danger of being cursed. If the reference is to apostasy, then it is not to those who are near to being cursed, but to those who would be cursed with eternal loss. It would be possible to interpret whose end is for burning. In Hebrews 6, 8, as a reference to eternal loss in hell, but it is also used, that word or that thought, that picture of fire is not only used about the unregenerate, it is also used about the regenerate. It is used about saved people, people who are born again, people like you and me, who know the Lord. The latter, is the, this case is the case in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where the fire of God is used for the people of God. When the focus is on the, the test, the quality, as we have just got through speaking in these two verses, of a Christian's works. They are tested by fire at the judgment seat of Christ. And it is the works of wood, hay, and stubble that is burned up during that time. The Bible tells us there will be some Christians there who 
didn't do much of anything with what they had that God had given them as a Christian. And they, all their works are going to be burned up and they're going to go into heaven with the smell of smoke on their clothes. And so the burning of this land uh, speaks to this judgment, I believe, along with the author, because it is a burning that is a burning of profit. The lake of fire is not a burning of profit. It's where all the unprofitable are put away and burn in judgment forever and ever and ever and are totally separated from God. If you were in the first century, you would have known exactly, it would have resonated completely what the author would have been speaking about because when you had a plot of land, it either produced good fruit or thorns and thistles. If you had the fruit, you reaped it. But if you had thorns and thistles, what would you do with that land? You would burn it off. You didn't burn the land. You burned what was on top of the land. And why would you do that? To make it profitable. The judgment seat of Christ is about your profit. In one way, that it's profitable. When you live for the Lord, that comes out of the fire. And not only are you given reward, but also maybe possibly position of service in the millennial reign of Christ. But what about the wood, hay, and stubble? I'm telling you, that's still for your profit. How so? It's not about your sins, it's about your works, the quality of your work that's going to be burned. And whatever you didn't do that was faithful, when you chose to live for yourself instead of the Lord, when you chose to be selfish and rebellious and ad nauseum, it's going to be burned up in the fire. And yes, you'll, you'll suffer loss in terms of reward and possibly service in the millennial kingdom, but let me tell you something. What the Lord is doing there, because Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 says, our God is a consuming fire, and that references to Christian people. Everything and anything that's in your Christian life that was not for the Lord. The Lord is going to burn it up and it is not going into heaven with you. It is not going to follow you. And not only will it not follow you, it will never be remembered ever again. I'm telling you, that's good news. Now, he gives them this illustration and he's been pretty rough on them so far. So now we're going to get into verse 9 and he's going to let them come up for air. It's important to breathe every once in a while. So here's what he says, because he's going to really encourage them here. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work, and God does not forget. He does not forget those things you do for him. You know that person you go and visit in the nursing home? And you say, I love you. God remembers that. And your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints. And do minister. You guys have been ministering in the past. In fact, you're ministering right now. Now, you're not what you should be, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we get to where we should be? But he said, I'm giving you some encouragement here. You've been doing some good things for the Lord, and that's good. But we have further to go. We have more work to do. Verse 11, and we desire that each one of you should... Show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, until the end of the race that God has set before you. That you do not become sluggish. Don't be like you have been in the past where you would listen and then you would turn away. You would listen, but you didn't really want to hear. Don't be like those Israelites at Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 13 and 14. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. There are promises that God gives to his people that come as a result of patience and perseverance. You don't want to miss that. The Israelites of Kadesh Barnea, they didn't miss heaven, but they missed the promised land, the physical inheriting that land where the big grapes were and and getting a plot of land there that they could call their own and settle down and and the milk and the honey and all the blessings of being there and seeing God through the victory They're at Jericho and beyond. They missed that because they didn't persevere. He says, don't be like that. 
Listen, hear what God has to say. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, and when you go to court and you're a witness, they make you put your hand on the Bible and say uh, that you're going to swear by God's name, right? To tell the truth. You swear by God's name because you have to swear by a greater name than your name or the oath doesn't mean anything. Well, there's no one greater than God. And so what does God do to confirm this promise that he's made to you and to me? He's going to swear by his own name. And that means uh, a lot saying, surely blessing, I will bless you, speaking about Abraham, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, speaking about Abraham, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them at the end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. It wasn't enough that he just made a promise, see. He confirmed this promise, swearing an oath to his own name. And his name represents everything that he is. This is what I'm going to seal my promise with to you, who I am. So if I don't do what I said I would do, what is my name worth? And it's that way for us, isn't it? We give our word we give our, we put our name down, and what are we saying? I pledge to do what I said I was going to do, or my word's no good. That by these two immutable things, changeless things in, in Greek life in the first century, the only person who could change the will is the person who made it and signed it. No one else could do it. Couldn't change. It is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge. Think about the cities of refuge there in the book of Numbers to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. There's that nautical term. Both sure and steadfast, steady, that's how we might say it, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner or trailblazer or one who has gone before us, which is much different than any of the priests of Aaron, has entered for us even Jesus having become our priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So um, a lot of stuff there. And uh, so what I want to do now is I want us to think in this terms <clears throat> of pressing on to maturity. And pressing on to maturity is a life that is steady. That's kind of the thought I want you to have today, all right? Now, here's the way a lot of Christians live their lives. Anything but steady. When everything goes really well, they say, God is great. But when things don't go so well, they say, where is God? And then their life will go on a little bit further, and then everything seems to be going great again, and so they will say, amen. And then sure enough, things are not going so well, and so now they will say, oh me. Does that sound like a uh, a Christian life that's pressing on to maturity to you? It sounds like a Christian life that is in total dependence upon what happens to that Christian man or woman. It sounds like to me that the circumstance dictates the feeling, the emotion, the experience of that Christian person. Doesn't it sound like that to you? Is that where God, is that, is that the greatness of our Christianity, of our Christian life? Is that a victorious Christian life? Up and down, if they like me, I'm happy. If they don't like me, I'm unhappy. 
If this person does what I want them to do, I'm happy. If they don't do what I want them to do, I'm unhappy. If things work out, I'm happy. If things don't work out, I'm unhappy. As long as I get the promotion, I'm happy. If they pass me over, I'm unhappy. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration that's used from our text here about this. Because the person that is used here is Abram who persevered to experience, to receive the promise that God had promised him. Now, that doesn't mean Abram was perfect. Now, that's good news for you and me. Because he received the promise, and I'm telling you, he did some major boo-boos in his life. Let me tell you about one of them. It, in, it, con, it in, included his wife, Sarah. You remember, Abraham was, and he was Abraham then, but he was 75 years old, and God said, you're going to have a son. And that son's going to have a multitude of people, and through your son's going to come, the Messiah will be a blessing to everybody who puts faith in it, right? Genesis 12. 75 years old when that happened. You're going to get a son. Now, Sarah's 65 this time. So, they got a son the next year, right? No, next year? Next year. Next year. Next year. Surely the next year. Surely next year. Next year. Next year. I don't know how many I've counted, but it took 15. It took 15 and still no son. Still no son. So, if he's 75, where is he now? He's 90. If he's 90, where is, it, where is it Sarah? She's at 80, brother. And you know what happens to her? Now watch this. You know what happens to her? 15 years go by, and she has a sinking feeling. Hello. You ever have one of those? She has a, a feeling of despair, doesn't she? And what was that despair? She grabbed her husband, and she says, look, we tried it God's way. We waited 15 years. I can't have any kids. I'm 80 years old. You know what you need to do? You need to go get my handmaid. We need to help God. Did God make a promise? Did he make a promise? Did he give, did he not give his word to Abraham? Did he not make a covenant with him? Did he not seal it with an oath where he swore by his name? And 15 years goes by and she's ready to throw in the towel. Well, we, it might only take us about five years, right? I'm telling you, this is not God's way. And I'm telling you, there were some consequences. You know, Abraham and Sarah, they, they both went to heaven. But we have to deal with the consequences today. Long after they've gone. Because they had a sinking feeling. Because they had a, a desire, a feeling of despair and disappointment. And you know what they decided to do with that despair and disappointment? They decided to take possession of it. They decided to run with it and believe it. I'm telling you, that is not steady as she goes. Now watch this. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we looked at that verse. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even through the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the bone and the marrow and as discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The, this, the word of God is spoken about there in how it deals with you and me. And we are in spirit, soul, and body. In our soul is thoughts and intents, that's our mind, that's where we think, our will is our, where we make our choices, and our emotions is where we get sinking feelings. Worry, despair, disappointment, hurt. 
Have you ever known somebody that left the church because they got their feelings hurt? They got offended? Where do you get offended, by the way? In your emotions. Not in your brain. Not in your big toe. You see, you have got to allow the Word of God to separate who you are. You've got to understand how you were made by God and how God functions through his word via the Holy Spirit in each one of these entities that your life consists of. If you don't, if you don't learn how to do this, you're never going to press on to maturity. And your life is going to be like that. You don't want to be like Sarah. By the way, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, in the next verse, verse 13, God says that uh, the Greek there is that he pins us down. Remember that? He pins us down and he lays us bare, naked. He pins us down. That's the word for uh, wrestling. You You have your opponent and your opponent gets you down on the ground so that you are totally vulnerable. There's nowhere that you can go. And then the next uh, verb speaks about the fact that as you're pinned down, you are totally naked before God. Naked and how so? The whole word, the word of God now can expose everything about your life so that you can see who you are in spirit, soul, and body and how God deals with each entity in your life. So that your life is not up and down, but your life If you go, if you have an X and Y axis, your life is going to be like that as opposed to that. Now, how are you going to do that? Okay, because we're out of time. And we'll we'll just keep working on this, okay? By the way, it's taken me uh, many years in my Christian life to be able to fine-tune these things I'm speaking to you about. It didn't happen in a week. Probably not going to happen for you in a week. Okay? But you can benefit from the years that I had to work to learn some of these things in a very short period of time. Very short. You can start using this thing, this stuff, in fact, today. There's a couple things that got to happen. You've got to let the Word of God work in your mind. Now, and what we're going to say here is concerning your mind, and we're just talking about your soul here, you know, your body, you're going to subject, you're going to submit to the authority of God as a living sacrifice. That's another thought. But your mind here, you're going to, with your mind, you're going to occupy your mind with the greatness and the sovereignty and the awesomeness of God. Now, that's what that text is talking about there. It's talking about how great God is. Okay. Now, you've heard of the term, the slogan, and it's, it's scripture, wait on the Lord. What does that mean, wait on the Lord? Anybody know what that means? You know, sometimes we go for years in church, we hear that, we don't really know. Does that mean just God wants you to be a potted plant and wait till he shows up? Is that what that means? No, it doesn't mean that. It didn't mean that for Abraham either. God didn't want him to be a potted plant until he was, what, 100 years old before he had Isaac. No, what he wanted him to do, and it, it, this would have kept him out of trouble. He wanted him to occupy his mind with the greatness of God. Now, we just have a couple minutes here. In Isaiah, let me illustrate this for you. In Isaiah chapter 40, everybody knows 40, 31, right? They that wait upon the Lord... Shall man up their wings as eagles, right? You shall run and not be weary, walk and not faint, right? Remember that? Everybody knows that scripture. <clears throat> but what does it mean to wait on the Lord? You know what? Chapter 40, in the, in the verses that precede verse 40, the first 39 verses, define what that mean. Now listen to this. Because waiting on the Lord is occupying your mind with who God is. Well, who is he? Okay, listen to this. Listen, this is awesome, man. 
Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. That's what God does. You know anybody else that can do that? You have a neighbor that can do that? Maybe your wife can do that, you know. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Verse 8, the word of our God stands forever. Behold, verse 10, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Listen to this, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Now, I've been, I have flown across the Pacific Ocean at 500 miles an hour for weeks, man. I'm telling you, there's a lot of water out there. Who is it that has held the waters, all the waters of the earth, in the hollow of his hand? No one but God. That's how small it is to him. Who has measured the heavens with a span? We can't even count the galaxies, galaxies, much less the stars. And calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Who has weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Listen to verse 15. Behold, the nations are a drop in the bucket. All nations, verse 17, before him are as nothing, and they are accounted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom, verse 18, will you liken God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the, of the earth? It is he. Isaiah writes this way long before Christopher Columbus. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He brings princes to nothing, verse 23. To whom shall you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. And on he goes. I'm just getting started. That's just in Isaiah 40. And see, what, what do Christians do today? You want to know why is all this mess in there? Because they're occupying their minds with garbage, with junk, with lies, with, with works that are, that are you know, burned up, with, with, with junk, and they just allow anything at all to come into their hearts. And so I'm going to say to you today, and then we'll talk some more about it as we close um, next week. You need to occupy your mind with the greatness and the, and the awesomeness of God. In Genesis 18, is it there? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? He's so great. He's so awesome. He's so incredible. Any problem you have is so small. It's, it's smaller than a micron. And secondly, and the Word of God helps us to do this, you need to exercise your will. And you're going to need to do this, particularly, not only with your mind and your thoughts, but with your emotions. And what happens to us, because we had such a bad habits in our life for years, is you'll get a sinking spell, you'll get a moment of despair or disappointment or depression or all that bad stuff, and it will be many times involuntary. It just happens. Okay, that's not a sin. What's a sin is if you accept it, if you take possession of it, if you take it to be your own and run with it. And this is where that comes into play, where you exercise your will. If you don't learn how to let God through his word do this in your life, I promise you, it will be anything but steady as you go. Let's pray. In 1527, Martin Luther had one of the most difficult years in his life. 
it had been 10 years prior since he had tacked up the thesis to the church door in Worms, Germany. And in the midst of that difficulty, he decided to write a hymn. The title of that hymn is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. One small part of the lyric says this, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Father, help us today to see how small our problems are and how awesome you are. You're calling upon your people to use the minds that you have given them and the word that you have given them to start believing what you've said rather than what the world says. Steady as she goes, this is your purpose in our life. In Jesus' name we pray.